Guys, how are we doing? Welcome to GoodWorks Tractors. This video is brought to you by Bora Wheel Spacers. Great solution to get lateral stability for your tractor. I'm gonna put these bad boys on my 1025R sometime soon. Link down below if you wanna add stability to your tractor too. I did it, folks. I actually kept a piece of equipment for a year, actually over a year, and so I wanna tell you all about it, my own experience, the good stuff, the bad stuff, some things I would do differently, or maybe I'd keep them the same. I am primarily gonna cover the 1025R. I'm also gonna talk about these dual wheels that I've had on here for a year now, as well as the VersaTurf tires. So if you end up enjoying this video, I would love to get a thumbs up from you and make sure you hit that subscribe button right down below. And if you're looking for something cool for your tractor, read through that description underneath the video or head on over to goodworkstractors.com. All right, here we go. This machine here is a 2018 1025R. I bought it with 120 some hours on it. It's got 172 now, so I've put on roughly 50 hours in a year. Honestly, that's pretty typical for a lot of you guys that own these tractors. There's some of you, of course, that are putting 100, 200, maybe 300 hours a year. There's other guys that are putting 10 hours a year, right? So this is kind of a typical usage. I've had this thing in a lot of different applications, in the lawn, in the snow, in the woods, in the mud. All across the board, the intent is I wanted to kind of put it through the paces, I wanted to see how it ran with this setup here as well, and then give my feedback after it's all said and done. Now one of the biggest reasons I chose to keep this for myself for the whole year is because it is a very, very popular model out there, and that's with good reason. You know, it's so multi-purpose, it's relatively affordable, especially once you start comparing it to the bigger series, right? The two, the three, the four series, they can really get out of control. For most folks that just have small acres properties, maybe even just a couple acres, could be 10, 15 acres. Unless you have some specific task, like I always use lifting round bales, for example. This is not going to do very well lifting round bales. You need to get a bigger tractor with more lift capacity. But most attachments, whether it's a grapple, a snow pusher, a tiller, a brush hog, a mower deck, a backhoe, all these things can be sized appropriately to fit the machine. So I try to give the love equally to the small tractors and the big tractors on my channel, but today is is all about this extremely popular 1025R, and it's popular for good reason. It's compact nature, it's affordable size, storage space requirements, maneuverability on small acreage, the list just goes on. And for me, I wanted to walk the walk instead of just talking the talk. And so I put this in the woods. You know, I navigated through all the trees and up and down the hills and the ravines just to see how it would navigate and fit in those tighter areas where you never know where the obstacle is gonna come into play. And it did a great job. You know, and in fact, here pretty soon, we're gonna be getting a big old pile of mulch delivered to go ahead and touch up all the different landscaping beds that I have around the yard. Gonna use this bucket for that as well. Now, before we go too deep into this, you're gonna see a lot of different accessories, attachments, you know, little trinkets that are all over this tractor. I did a whole separate video. You know, I think it was like the 50 best accessories, options, and add-ons or something like that for the 1025. Check that video out if you want to get more information on how to deck out your tractor. But let's start out with the experience with the front end loader, the 120R loader. This could be the H120 loader as well if you have an older generation. Same thing, same lift capacity, same lift height. It's going to come on and off the tractor the same way as well. You know, I probably took this front end loader on and off my tractor I don't know, I feel like 50 times this year. In fact, we made a video between me and my brother behind the camera there on just how easy it is to take it on and off, even for somebody who's never done it before versus somebody who's done it all the time. It gets easier with time, even after doing it maybe even five times. You can take this off in maybe a minute and a half and put it back on in just about the same amount of time. And that proved true throughout the course of the year. I didn't have any issues taking it off or reconnecting it. It was as easy to do the first time as it was the last time. As far as the bucket goes, this is also gonna be quick attached. It's a standard setup. And for me, that proved almost invaluable. I mean, it was so versatile being able to put the bucket on with the tooth bar here, switch it over to a snow pusher, switch it over to a grapple, switch it over to the stump bucket as well, and vice versa. You can take this on and off very, very, very quickly. It's just a couple of pins, one on each corner down there, and you can swap it right from the operator seat, go up to your other attachment, pick it up, put those pins back in, and away you go. Now it's pretty incredible just how much this tooth bar enhances the bucket itself. You go from having a flat edge, kind of like this flat edge here, but, but down in the bottom, to having all these different teeth that really cut and dig and just open up the versatility, especially in hard pack or in gravel, stone, rock. This worked really well last spring when I was trying to navigate a washout that was in the woods in my hunting lease. You know, I was able to rake everything down on one side, push it forward on the other side and really level it out and smooth it out. Did a fantastic job and I think it made a lot better work than just having the bucket itself. 
The great thing about these subcompacts is finally we're getting to a point in time where all these manufacturers are coming out with appropriately sized equipment. Historically, a lot of the equipment, and the stump bucket in particular, was way too big for a small tractor like this. So in fact, I came out with a stump bucket to fit appropriately on a smaller tractor, a subcompact, or maybe a, a small compact as well, where it's a very narrow, you know, it's only about eight inches at the front, small, compact, little bucket to be able to get down into bushes, shrubs, uh, small trees and saplings where you can just pop them right out of the ground. If you have stones that are half buried down in the ground, you can get really good leverage and a concentrated section there and pop those out. Even if you want to do some shallow trenching, you're able to do that with a stump bucket. There's a version for the John Deere Quick Attach and for the Skid Steer Quick Attach as well. And pallet forks are probably one of the top attachments that I sell. You know, you think maybe they're only for moving pallets, but folks find all sorts of creative uses for pallet forks, whether it's moving stacks of logs or brush. Sold a pair this morning actually to a guy that's moving his verticutter just taking it from the ground putting it in his truck bed to move from job to job so the options are almost endless with a set of pallet forks nobody ever regrets getting a pair as far as winter time goes you can get a couple great options to fit on the front with one of the quick attached snow plows or the ever popular snow pusher i do recommend either a 60 inch wide snow plow or the 54 inch hla 1500 snow pusher sell a whole boatload of those things every year and i have nothing but great feedback I actually used a 72 inch on mine uh, for a couple of reasons. I wanted to see what it would do, you know, and then I also had the duals on here that make it about 72 inches wide. So I wanted to cover those tracks and we had a really bad winter this year and well, bad as in not a lot of snow this winter and the previous winter. So didn't have as many opportunities as I would have hoped, but pushed about four inches of snow with a 72 inch wide pusher. It actually did a pretty good job, but I'd still recommend the 54 inch. The other really popular item to put on the front end of your tractor is gonna be either a brush crusher or maybe a work saver, some sort of a grapple. So whether that's completely mechanical, maybe it's electric, maybe it's hydraulic, you have a lot of options out there, options are good. Now I've used all three on the 1025R. They're gonna come in at different price points as well. So you have to have you know a different perspective on the amount that you want to invest or maybe what you wanna get out of your grapple too. But the brush crusher is gonna be typically the cheapest option to get into. You don't have any other electric or hydraulic connections. You simply put it on just like your bucket. But since the brush crusher doesn't have those additional connections, that means it's gonna have the most limited range of motion. For most folks, this is just fine. But if you need to have a true third range of motion. So say you clamp down on a load and you need to be able to roll it all the way forward or rock it all the way back, you're gonna to have to look into an electric or hydraulic grapple. So the electric grapple is gonna come with an actuator, comes with the whole kit you need with a, a controller as well. So you can push a button to open and close it. A thousand pounds of clamping force that you're gonna have on there. Very easy DIY setup. You don't have to go to a dealer to have anything done. Now the WorkSaver hydraulic mini grapple, another great option, requires you to have a third function or a diverter kit. You need to have some additional circuit to be able to open and close the jaw of the grapple. So I have installed a Summit diverter kit on here. It's a very easy DIY solution. You can do it in two hours or less. It's a lot cheaper than getting a factory third function on your tractor as well. And it gives you that ability to put a hydraulic grapple on the front and open and close the jaws of the grapple while still maintaining the curl roll function and then being able to raise and lower your loader. Now the great thing about those Summit kits is that you can save 5% with code GWT and purchase at Summit-Hydraulics. There's gonna be a link down below. I wanted to give you some bad about the front end of this tractor or even subcompacts in general, but I really can't. You know, the one thing that most folks are probably gonna say is a negative about them is the overall lift capacity or the lift height. However, I went into it knowing or having a realistic expectation of what this tractor can do, you know, and I think if you go into it the same way, you know, realizing you need to size your attachments smaller, right? So they're gonna be lighter, they're gonna be narrower, they're gonna have less, um, you know, holding capacity, like in a bucket, for example, or with a snow pusher, it's gonna be a, a narrower path of snow that you're gonna clear at one time. If you go into it with the right perspective, you're gonna be a lot happier. If you think you're gonna be borderline for whatever your needs are, then don't go with the small of a tractor. It's a lot better to go with one size bigger, but that's just my two cents and my take on it. Understand what you're getting with the tractor before you make that big investment. So I don't have it installed right now and it's probably what I use the least amount. Oh wait, no, there, there's one more thing that I use basically not at all the entire year. <clears throat> it made my overrated list if you might remember that. But the mower deck on this tractor, I actually mow my lawn with a real mower. It's about an inch tall. This year we're gonna go sub one inch, so I'm a little crazy like that, but 
I have used these mowers in the past. I think they do a perfectly fine job, especially if you're gonna mow at a normal height. You know, three to four inches are gonna do really well for that kind of an application. But I did use this mower and a Protero PTO driven dump from the seat bagger system to tackle all my leaf cleanup in the fall. I probably had it installed on there for maybe six to eight weeks, somewhere in that general ballpark and just went out here and mowed up all the leaves. Um, basically once a week for about two months. If you can stay on top of them, it's a lot easier than letting them all pile up, but that's when it really excelled as well. I will say if you're gonna run a bagger, something that has a boot mounted on one side of the deck, you're gonna have to do some alignment. So I noticed it right away um, where it was kind of scalping or cutting uneven, you know, on one side or the other because that weight of the boot is kind of you know, weighing down one side and it's raising up the other side. So you gotta think about that ahead of time and make some adjustments. And then if you go into springtime as well, when you take your bagger off, you're gonna wanna readjust because you're not gonna have the weight offsetting it on one side. I will say I really enjoy the Protero bagger. It's great to have a PTO driven or powered unit. It's very powerful that way. And also dump from the seat. So when I'm sitting right up here, right in this area is gonna be a handle. You can just pull that handle you back up to your pile, you dump it out, and you get back to mowing and sucking up more leaves. Very efficient use of time that way, and it's something that's gonna last a long, long, long time. For many years, you could buy this and have it for maybe 20, 30 years. Even if you get a different machine, you could just get a different boot to mate up with your mower deck, and then you'll still be good to go. An attachment like that is great for spring and fall cleanups, and the best part about it, you can get 5% off with code GWT. You go to Protero Inc., link down below, place your order, they'll ship it factory direct. While we're talking about the mower deck, I do want to mention the dual wheels. Overall, I absolutely love the dual wheel setup. I'm going to get to that more in just a minute here, but I want to mention that if you are running a mower deck on your tractor, a mid-mount mower, not a rear finish mower, you can't run this dual wheel setup. It is going to interfere, not with the mower deck itself, but you have those rear gauge wheels or anti-scalp wheels that will interfere with this extra tire that's out here. So when I was running that setup in the fall, I did have to take this dual wheel setup off. And so one of the things I'm probably happiest to report on after a year is the performance of the dual wheel setup in general. There was even a poll that was conducted on one of the forums that I saw a while back, you know, on whether or not you would run a dual wheel setup. And then a lot of the comments down below saying, no way you're going to break your axle, you're going to snap it in half. So I ran these duels in a lot of different applications on a lot of goofy angles, uneven terrain. I really was interested to see. I, if I broke an axle, I broke an axle. You know, that's kind of the whole point of me having this whole setup for the years. I just wanted to see what happened. I wasn't confident that I was going to damage anything, and so far, nothing has happened. Again, it's only been about 50 hours of use, but that's a full year for a lot of you folks, and it kind of gives you a good idea of what it will do. These duels, the main reason I have them, besides I think they look really cool, is the fact that they give you so much lateral stability side to side. It's just an incredible amount of difference. You know, on my front yard where I turn around and, and in the woods, you get that real tippy feeling. I hate it, it makes you super uncomfortable. I think tractors are long and skinny as it is and they're just waiting to tip over on the side. I know a lot of accidents have happened, so especially if you're not running a mower deck, this is a really good solution for you. So this is a very easy, actually a pretty lightweight kit too that you can install by yourself. You just get the adapter and some long bolts and some nuts and hardware. Get yourself an extra set of wheels and tires. You can do it all yourself right in your garage. Probably have it done in an hour, maybe 90 minutes at the most. MillerTire.com, put a link down below in the description or you can go to my website. There's gonna be a link where you can follow along um, where to get it from Miller Tire. And the best part is you get 5% off with code GWT. I do want to mention one other downside while I'm thinking about it, besides not being able to run a mid-mount mower with it. You're going to have to have wider attachments unless you don't mind maybe not covering your entire path that you're going through. Um, so same thing can be said on the front end if you have a snow pusher and you're plowing snow, or maybe on the back side if you are tilling a garden or brush hogging, that's something you want to keep in mind. You know, it's not the end of the world, but you have to know that when you're brush hogging or, or plowing or whatever it is, that you're going to have wheels sticking out. and so it depends on what kind of terrain or application you're going through if it's going to make sense for you and so i am going to take these duels off here pretty soon and put on the wheel spacers i want to kind of do the same long-term test see how i like them how they perform how they give me that stability as well i know folks have been running spacers for a long time and there's a lot of good feedback i just want to have my own personal opinion on it as well so i'll circle back on that in about a year from now while we're talking about the wheels and the tires, let's talk about these VersaTurfs. These were awesome. I remember being so excited, just waiting in anticipation because I ordered them when they first came out and it took, I don't know, four or six weeks to get them in. 
I absolutely love these tires. They are a perfect combination. You know, they're a radial tire as well. They're not biased. They're the only radial tire option that you can get on these smaller tractors, but it's a hybrid pattern, a hybrid tread pattern on here. A little bit of everything, right? A little bit of your standard R4 industrial, some of your traditional R1 ag tire, and then also a little bit of your turf tire mixed in there as well to give you something that's so versatile, safe to be on your lawn, but great traction in the mud, the dirt, and even snow and ice as well. So as far as price point goes on tires like this, they're actually not a whole lot more than the other traditional bias tire options that are out there. So again, this is a tire you can get from millertire.com. Use code GWT to save 5%. If I was gonna pick apart one thing about these tires, I would probably say that I wish these fronts were just a little bit wider. On rare occasions in the right conditions, if I'm in my lawn, and that's primarily where it is, if I'm turning really sharp, I can see where it's, it's dug in. I've never had an area where it has not recovered. Um, and like any tire, if you're doing it on wet, soggy lawn, or if you're turning in the same spot repeatedly, you're gonna wear that area out. You're just asking for trouble. So that's the one thing I would say though, is on occasion, I can see where that front tire turn or kind of dug in when it was turning. I'm not in four wheel drive, but even so, you know, I wanna give you an honest assessment of it. Overall, I would never get one of these tractors without the VersaTurfs. They're still relatively new to the market, so you're not gonna see a lot of these used tractors that are out there with them already, but you can order them new from John Deere with the VersaTurf tires already installed. Before we get to the backside of the tractor, I do wanna mention, I've actually got all four of these tires loaded. Liquid ballast inside, they're filled up, you know, all the way up to in this area right here with that liquid ballast to give me the additional counterweight that I want. Again, going back to some of those forum threads and other um, conversations, it was thought that maybe don't put the liquid ballast in the outside tires just to put a little bit less stress on the axle. In the end, really, that's your decision to make. I chose to do it just to see what would happen, right? So I wanted as much ballast weight as I could get when I'm using that front end loader or anything on the front side. It's really helped keep me planted to the ground, very secure, very safe feeling. That's just my two cents, but I haven't had a problem. So what you got going on the back side here is uh, not a backhoe, I can tell you that. Now this tractor came with a backhoe, but that is something that uh, it did. It made my overrated list over a year ago. And for me, that's holding true. You know, it's doing what I think a lot of folks that get a backhoe end up having happen. You know, it just sits there. It sits there parked, normally outside somewhere, so it's in the elements, not being protected. It's about the most expensive attachment you can get, especially for a smaller tractor like this, and that's just a lot of money to tie up. Now for me, I thought I was gonna have some value in it. I thought I was gonna have a few projects that I could use that backhoe for that would make life easier. However, I found ways around that. I actually used the stump bucket for a tree. You can maybe you can see a dirt area back there. I dug up a tree last fall. It was about eight or nine inches in diameter. Thought it was gonna be too big for the stump bucket, but with time, I, I got it out of there. And then same thing with a couple older rotten stumps that were towards the back that I wanted to get out of the way. Ended up just using the tooth bar on the bucket and kind of hammered away at them over time and out they came. I know a lot of you guys have an ongoing need for a backhoe or you find it to be super valuable. And that's not to say there's never gonna be an exception to a rule. But for most of us, you've got one or two big projects that you really want that backhoe for, and then it's gonna sit there wasting away. I'd highly recommend just renting a mini excavator for a weekend or two. They're gonna be a lot more efficient in most applications, so you can get it done a lot quicker. You're not gonna have thousands and thousands of dollars sitting there for years to come. You just rent it for a weekend or two for a few hundred bucks, and you're all done. Now I use this three point hitch for all sorts of stuff throughout the year, probably more things than I can actually remember, but a wide variety of attachments. One of them that stands out that I wanted to use, I was really excited to use, was gonna be a 48 inch cedar, the Tar River DRL 048, the four foot version of it. I was really looking forward to using that for food plots out of my hunting lease late last summer or early fall. However, I backed up to that cedar, confident to pick it up and put it on my trailer and it wouldn't even get it off the ground. So the position of the weight on your three-point hitch is really going to affect how much you can actually lift. The further out it is, the further back this way, the lower the amount you're gonna lift. But if you can keep all that weight tucked into pretty much where this hopper is right here on the spreader, you're gonna be good to go. But that was the problem with the cedar is the fact that it really extends out. So you have a lot of weight that's further out here with the roller and the discs and everything else that are gonna just push it too far out. So unfortunately, you know, the limited lift capacity and limited lift height that you have on the 1025 are, are really subcompacts in general, just is really not a good combination for an attachment like a cedar. But what I really love about these smaller attachments in general on the three point is most of them can be 
maneuver around pretty easy. You know, a, a poly hopper like this, you know, one guy can pick it up and move it right onto your three point hitch. Whether you have a quick hitch like the Spico or not, same thing with the, the Thatcher, um, the sprayer, you know, a tank sprayer when it's empty. But the list goes on of what I hooked up to this thing. I used the sweep ball sweeper, the pull behind aerator, of course, had the bagger on here too. I used a flail mower. I didn't use a tiller or a brush hog this year at all, but I just used a wide variety of, of tools that were on the backside and had a positive experience with everything. Oh, and I even actually was able to use a chipper, a three-point chipper, PTO powered, out in the woods last spring, chipping up some material out there. It worked really well. It's all about sizing the equipment appropriately to fit the machine. So if you have some maybe legacy equipment, you know, left over from an old uh, homestead or maybe a neighbor has it that you're just trying to make work, that's when failures are normally gonna happen. But if you, again, can plan ahead, go into it so that everything kind of works together with the attachments and the tractor, the expectations, the project size, maybe the project duration as well, you're gonna be a lot happier with the outcome. Now, kind of bringing the front end and the back end together, when you are using that front end loader, you wanna have appropriate ballast weight on the back side of the machine. So we touched on it already with the liquid ballast and the tires, but you also need to have weight back here in addition to that. So whether you get yourself a ballast box or if you get like a weight bracket, like the heavy hitch weight bracket. Uh, there's links down below in the description and on my website to where to get all this kind of equipment, but you wanna have suitcase weights or the all sorts of counterweight back here, maybe even an attachment as well to offset whatever you're picking up because the last thing you want is to get a heavy load way up in the air and then all of a sudden realize the backside wants to come off and it's kind of a teeter-totter on the front axle. That's a bad spot to be in. So figure that plan out ahead of time before you find yourself in that scenario. So I can think of three issues that I had with the tractor this year. And I guess one of them was really the tractor's fault. The other two just kind of happened. Uh, number one, I was out in the woods, I think it was last spring and came back and realized there was a puddle of oil underneath the tractor. Turns out I got a stick or some sort of debris right into the transmission filter, uh, the hydro filter that's down there. I really think that these, and I've mentioned it before, should have skid plates or at least a skid plate option underneath the tractors to protect the hoses and the filters and anything else that's easily damaged on the bottom side of not just a 1025R, but all tractors in general. I also had a couple uh, drippy or leaky quick couplers that are down here for the hoses that uh, connect the hydraulic system to the front end loader as well. Part of that could be on me. I tend to be kind of forgetful and put the dust covers on those outlets. So if you get a lot of debris, dust, other buildup inside there, that's going to kind of compound the issue. So do yourself a favor and really try to stay on top of that if you can. Honestly, in the grand scheme of things, that's not the end of the world. A little bit of oil here or there is just something to monitor. Make sure you're, you're checking your hydraulic system and top it off as needed. If you're gushing oil, that's another story. But what I experienced in those couple of situations was pretty minor. Probably the biggest inconvenience that I had was actually with the battery. The tractor just decided one day, I think it was after we got done doing the stump bucket video this winter, the tractor just wasn't gonna start. Sometimes you'd get a little bit of flashing light up here, but you'd go to turn it over and nothing would happen. Couldn't figure out what was going on. Would charge it, would jump it, it would work, and then the next day it would be back to square one again. So turns out it was just a bad battery that decided to work one day and then not work the next day. So I can't really blame it on the tractor, but it was a bad battery. Once we replaced it, we were back in action. Now, some people say you overpay for green and you know what? I think that there is value in pretty much everything, you know? And one of the huge benefits about buying a green or an orange tractor, John Deere or Kubota, is that because they're so popular, there's some other almost intangible benefits that you get that you don't even think about, you know, just the general dealer support, the whole dealer network all around the country, you know, that just has the parts and the service available that's a lot more accessible than some of the other companies that are out there. Uh, same thing with online support forums. There's so many forums, just tractor forums, all about subcompact and compact tractors. And with the largest um, group of ownership on John Deere and Kubota, you really get a lot more benefit out of those tractor forums because that many more users are familiar with the individual tractors or maybe had an issue or didn't know what this was or maybe made modifications and, and cool little gidgets and widgets and add-ons for them as well. And because they're so well known and because there's all the popularity and all the owners and all the dealers all over the place, they are going to hold their resale value better. So if you're buying one used, you can expect a very slow or very uh, long drawn out amount of depreciation. They're gonna hold their value very well. Same thing with Kubota, I would mention. But if you're going into one of the lesser brands, I would expect 
to take a bigger depreciation hit. It's just reality. There's not as many people out there that are driving the demand up for it. And so they're gonna be a little bit pickier about what they can kind of get that tractor for in the used market. Or if you're looking for one, you're probably gonna be in the same position. You're willing to pay a little bit more because they're just selling for more. So again, if you wanna get a better idea of all these little accessories and add-ons like the mirrors, the grab handles, the steps, the saw haul, chainsaw holder there, and, and the list goes on. Check out that other video about the 50 accessories, options, and add-ons uh, for the tractor, the 1025R in particular. All sorts of great information there. I really appreciate you taking the time to stop by. If you enjoyed this video, I'd love to get a thumbs up from you. Make sure you hit that subscribe button right down below and read through the description as well. There's going to be a lot of helpful links down there for tractor owners or head on over to goodworkstractors.com. So until next time, stay safe and we'll see you soon.